by having any timeouts. Really, they were going to go dancing for the first time in 42 years. Jean Baptiste would have nothing of that. And yet, Bob Ritchie's done a really nice job of kind of squelching things and saying, this is a different team. Yes, we have a mission to reach March Madness, but first things first, they've got to take care of business this evening against a really good Catamounts team. The Paladins of Furman control the opening tip. They are wearing the white as the higher seed. And there is Bothwell, muscles to the basket. And it opens the scoring in this SoCon semifinal. That's a tough matchup for freshman DJ Campbell. That's a true freshman on a fifth year guy that scored close to 2,000 points. Fontarius Wolbright, a 6'6 point guard, his pass awry, and Bothwell pushes the other way. Furman in the quarterfinals trailed at the half against Mercer before unleashing a full court press in the second half and route to an easy win. Turnovers, certainly something to watch by the Catamounts, as is transition defense. Russell Jones knocks it down. Five foot eight, lightning in a shot glass. Those that have followed NCAA tournament action may re remember he played on a Winthrop team two years ago that started, he started that game against Villanova. So he's got NCAA tournament experience. Bothwell launches from the outside. It's not there. And Wolbright, who had 10 rebounds in the quarterfinal win against ETSU, pulls it down, but he traveled it. And that's the second really unforced turnover by Wolbright. Leads the Southern Conference in assists per game. Maybe not necessarily a natural point guard, but boy, he is a really good lead guard for this Catamounts team. And a nice backcourt with Jones Jr. and Trey Jackson. And he's dangerous, too. A great rebounder off the glass can initiate that break quickly. J.P. Pegues, a three, building off a 22-point game in the quarters. Talk about point guards. Pegues, I think he's the most improved player in this conference. Took over for Alex Hunter, who had just been fantastic. In fact, Bob Ritchie had never coached a game without Alex Hunter at point guard. Pegues has been terrific in his second year. Those were dinosaur footprints he was walking into this year as a starter. There's Tyjon Claude. He's going to have to be big today. From the outside, that one off line by DJ Campbell, the freshman. And now Pegues the other way. Bothwell catch and release. In and out. Claude had it knocked away. And we'll get a foul on Jalen Slauson. That shot didn't go in. But boy, well, that's just an example of how fast Pegues and these... Paladins want to play. He pushed it up court and then he found the skip pass. Bothwell in the corner just didn't go, but that's dangerous. Right? You can't let that continue to happen if you're Western Carolina. In the December 31st Western Carolina win against Furman, we saw a Catamounts team that punched. And Furman almost looked a little shell-shocked. Hey, somebody hit us in the mouth as Woolbright misses the layup. This is a Western Carolina team. They want to be physical. They want to play this game in the 60s. They don't want it to be a track beat. I don't know that they can win a game that gets real fast. All right, now the tempo belonging to Furman, Bothwell to Slauson, the two first-team all-conference selections. And if you're saying that a lot tonight, partner, that's not good news for Western Carolina. Anthony Jordan, Will Howard, Ryan Christian, our officials this afternoon. Woolbright left it short, tried to follow his shot, able to get him, kick it back. That's Jackson. His three no good, rebounded by Pegues. Catamounts have fallen in love with the three a little bit early. 10 of 22 in the quarters, but not a great three-point shooting team in the regular season. Slauson down low. Garrett Heen able to draw the foul. It's on Claude, and that's something to watch. Tajon Claude's going to have to stay out of foul trouble today. He certainly does. Transfer from Moorhead State. Well, he's hardworking. He's just a tough post player, but he's really the true, only true low post presence that the Catamounts have. Keep in mind, he didn't play in that second game, the return game to Furman in February. And that's part of the reason I think that score got out of hand early.
Furman last made the NCAA tournament back in 1980, 43 years ago. And it's the type of team, too, Dean, with the veterans they have. They get the right matchup in round one, especially if it's a power conference team. It could get interesting. You said it in the opening. This was a three-team race really from the midway point of conference play and no disrespect to Samford or UNCG I think Furman is the most complete team and to your point yes the right matchup whatever that is uh, they can cause problems for somebody in a one game neutral atmosphere a 7-0 run for the top seeded Paladins 15 and 3 in conference in the regular season and a quarterfinal win against Mercer Western Carolina 10 and 8 in league play the four seed after finishing last in the league a season ago Jones the rainbow And out of bounds to Furman Well the Paladin defense has been solid They are certainly dialed in showing no nerves here of kind of being the favorite they Came in here with the right mindset yesterday particularly in the second half against Mercer with back-to-back -back games, both teams going to their bench early. Pekis, the three, rolls out. Wilbright, another rebound. Up ahead to Jackson, down low. And the shot block from behind. Alex Williams denying Colin Granger. Now Williams has a big size advantage. There's the double, kicks it out to Marcus Foster. Catamount switching everything on the perimeter. They can do that, especially with Claude out of the game. Foster the middle range. How many shots have rimmed out for Furman? Yeah, fortunate for the Catamount, so they'd be down double digits. Campbell nearly lost it. Crafty crossover by Wilbride, who gets the friendly roll. And that's where he's really good. He can get in the paint. And he can score, but better distributing for others. Tyrese Huey in the high post. Now it's Bothwell. Has the mismatch on Granger. Takes him to the basket and draws the foul. The Furman Paladins have preached unfinished business all season long. Off to a fast start in semifinal number one. To dancing a season ago, SOCON championship against Chattanooga in overtime. Mike Bothwell delivers the go-ahead basket. 4.3 seconds left. David Jean Baptiste be the hero, the buzzer beater to stun Furman. Chattanooga would go to the big dance, nearly upset Illinois in round one, but just a couple of seconds, a couple of breaks. Imagine if Bothwell hits that shot and that's the game winner. We remember that sequence so differently. No question. And, and he's the hero and remembered forever. Again, I think that's one of the reasons Bothwell and Slauson have come back. And there's no question they've heard about it all season long. From the time the season started, that's what it's been about for the Palins to get back, to reach that, that elusive goal that they haven't been able to reach in so many years. A smaller scale, but you think back of that UNC Villanova championship. Marcus Page, it's one of the great shots in the history of the NCAA championship game that nobody remembers because on the very next play, Chris Jenkins hits the game winner at the buzzer. Wolbright leaning in, got his own miss. Now it's Jackson, and he can heat up if he gets going. He certainly can. You know, Woolbright showed you the ability there to get in the paint and rebound at his size from the guard slot. And to your point, you also see what Trey Jackson can do. Alex Williams, bully ball. Granger grabs the board. And this Western Carolina team not afraid to push. Woolbright, the reverse layup. It drops. And the Catamounts close to one. Keep in mind, both Woolbright and Jackson were second team by the coaches all conference. So. By those that lead, they were determined two of the best ten players in this conference. Slauson's been quiet so far, the SoCon player of the year. Bothwell on the baseline drive, he can do it all. You put a guard on him, you put Harris with some size on him. He just understands how to score the ball. 
Rockies become more well-rounded every year. A three no good by Wilbright, just a 28% three-point shooter coming into the tourney. Carter Witt drops it off, Alex Williams lines it up, misfires, and the rebound to Western Carolina. And they're moving quickly, in transition, knocked away, and out of bounds. The Catamounts can play fast, yes, but in talking with Justin Gray this morning, right, he, he mentioned to us, can we keep this thing in the 60s or low 70s? Due in part, that's where Furman is at their best. They led the Southern Conference at 82 points a game, but also I don't know that Gray's got the bench and the depth to really get into a track meet for 40 minutes. Dean, this is a starting five for Western that could play for anybody. Beyond that, it's a question as to how much they can get. Claude, the turnaround, pretty move. He's an X factor, a guy with 10 double doubles, led the league in rebounding. Doesn't necessarily have a go to move, everything around the rim, but he's got to be a 30 minute a game guy to, to also. Jackson picks up the foul. Talk about Claude, just a hard working guy. Nice interior pass by Harris. And that's where Claude is at his best. Any, everything inside of about eight feet, he knows that. He'll take an occasional three, but that's not where he's at his best. Again, he missed the second Furman game. In fact, he missed three plus games with an ankle injury in mid-February. He's now played in several games since and is healthy, but he's that one true low post presence. And we saw in the Mercer game yesterday well, that is one area where Furman is susceptible. Poteen and Slauson have size and athleticism, but yeah, they're not just guys that are going to sit on the block. Shot clock down to two. Pegues has to let it go. And the rebound to Bernard Pelot, who had a big game off the bench. 14 points in the quarters. Knocked down four threes. Both he and Harris. And Granger, those are the three guys off the Catamount bench. They've got to give them quality minutes. Just keep the music going while they're in there. Pelote looking for help. Campbell, the runner. No, Slauson there. Pagese runs the show, but he, he and Carter Witt in there now. They're two point guards that can play together. He off the feed from Witt, back irons it. Carter Witt, a Wake Forest transfer. YouTube is high school highlights, it looks like Steve Nash. His minutes up now in league play. He's really kind of settled into his role after transferring. I think he's also played a part in why Pagese has been so good, just going at each other every day. He's got the Spicoli look too. <laughs> Campbell stops, hits, and Western Carolina on a 9-2 run to take their first lead. Campbell's an impressive-looking freshman. 22 minutes a game, solid minutes for a first-year guy. Out of bounds, it'll stay with Furman. We are off and running in Asheville. Western coverage continues tomorrow with the West Coast Conference semis starting at 9 p.m. So think about that. When Furman was last in the NCAA tournament, yes, there was champ week, but there was no champ week on ESPN. <laughs> yeah, it's been that long ago. Sad to say, I do remember that. <laughs> Maybe I was in high school, I don't remember, but it has been an awfully long time. Uh, and, and they've had some really good teams. You know, we've, we've talked about what Bob Ritchie's done. Really, it got started by Nico Medved. He, Bob was an assistant. And in, in that Nico's last year, they won 23 games. He went on to Drake for a year. He's now been at Colorado State, led the Rams to the NCAA tournament last year. But Bob has not only continued those winning ways, but he's built on that. And it is a true program in every sense. And if you look over the years, they've scheduled some pretty tough non-conference teams and showed well. They beat Louisville last year in 2021. They lost to Alabama by three, lost to Cincinnati by five. In the 2020 season, they took Auburn to overtime. 
They've matched up with some of the better teams in America and showed well for a mid-major. And again, you have a lot of experience on this team, a lot of guys who've been part of those battles. Absolutely. They just want to finish it here over the next couple of days, but the Catamounts playing well, even though they're not shooting it, particularly from behind the arc very well. Their defense has been solid, but they've also been fortunate. The Paladins have missed a couple of chippies. Bothwell was going right at Claude. Now it's Slauson, and his first basket is a three. He's 38% behind the arc this year. Again, he's kind of like Bothwell. Every year he's gotten better. Think about this. Jalen Slauson scored 19 points in his first year at Furman as a freshman. He had more personal fouls. He had 31 fouls and just 19 points. He's now the player of the year. And he was defensive player of the year in the league last year. A Da Vinci in high tops. He can do it all. Score, rebound, block shots, play defense. In fact, he ranks in the top five in the league in scoring field goal percentage, rebounds, blocks, and steals. Just does a little bit of everything is right. And it's through a great work ethic. He's got a great motor about him. Basketball family. Dad actually played in the Southern Conference at the Citadel. And his dad, Tom, said being a Citadel grad, I hated Furman, but he said he'll wear the purple for a few years, not much longer, although Jalen Swanson would like that journey to continue for a few more weeks. Sure, blood thicker than water there. I think the Catamounts, it got a little fast and kind of frenetic there for a moment, but they've got the pace where they run it right now. Bothwell over Claude. He bats it back. Slauson again. Way off. And it comes to the five foot eight Jones. Woolbright lost his balance, turns it over. Bothwell ahead to Slauson. Fouled by Jones. Slauson saw the mismatch. 6 7 against 5 8. Went right to the rim. That's Woolbright's third turnover. He kind of picked his dribble up, and when you do that, you're almost guarding yourself. Bothwell comes up with it. He finds the sprinting Slauson. There are no layups in tournament time. Nice job by Jones Jr. to force Slauson to at least earn it at the line. You mentioned the turnovers. That's an area where Western Carolina prides itself. Only 10 turnovers a game. They've got the lowest turnover rate in the SOCON. You see part of the reason and Woolbright, and Jones, even Jackson, you've got multiple ball handlers on the floor at once. And they can't afford to have those unforced turnovers. All three of Woolbright's have led to some kind of run out, and they've led to points. Justin Gray in his background can't like that. Gray played for the late Skip Prosser at Wake Forest, and then he took over after Skip's son, Mark who was the head coach at Western Carolina, took over at Winthrop. Mark was a longtime assistant there. Part of the dominoes with Pat Kelsey going from Winthrop to the College of Charleston. Gray was going to follow him to Charleston, and then this job opened up, and you know how that works in the coaching circles. No question. It, there really weren't many better than Skip Prosser and his coaching tree. Jones lets it fly. The rebound pulled down by Foster. That was a big time rebound by Foster right there. I think he's their X factor. He can do it at both ends. And he beating Claude to the basket. He is athletic and sure handed. And in many instances, he's the benefactor. Look, he's very talented, but he's the benefactor of like the other perimeter post defender because that best one's going to be on Slauson. Many times he's take advantage of that. And he poking that one loose. It'll stay with the Catamounts. Nifty move right there by Heen on that last possession. Fakes the handoff, keeps the dribble alive, and just goes right at Claude. Claude can only do so much with one foul. It's like a basketball version of a zone read. Woolbright down the lane, through the contact, count it. This is as aggressive as I have seen Vontarius Woolbright all season long. 
He is offensively really looking to attack regardless of what Paladin's guarding him. That's a nice left-hand finish with contact. Eight points, four rebounds so far. He does have the three turnovers. You mentioned 10, 10 points, 10 rebounds. He also had five assists yesterday in the win. And just a couple of weeks ago, he had a triple-double. Yeah, that was against VMI in the regular season finale. He had a 30-point game against Wofford. He's almost a chameleon. He can be what you want on any given night. Yeah, and he can play off the ball if you want to put Russell Jones Jr. there. Great find by Bothwell, Taheen, and Claude just picked up a second. Mark that down at the 758 mark. That is a terrific pass by Bothwell. He took it on the wing. On the handoff drive, pick and roll, perfect pass, perfect finish. Not so for perfect for the Paladins. Zero in purple, Tyjon Claude, top rebounder in the SoCon, picked up his second foul before we went to break. He is Western Carolina's most reliable interior player. So let's start with the Catamounts. What does that mean for them defensively? Now the game within the game, the last 7.58 here, the first half. Justin Ray Gray's going to have to manage. You know, does he play Claude? Does he sit him? I think right now he's going to have to go with a variety of guys. Maybe it's Colin Granger, maybe it's Tyler Harris, even Bernard Pello. I mean, he just, and we may see some zone out of the Catamounts as well because the, the, the Paladins just two of 10 behind the arc. But to your point, yeah, this changes things. And Bob Ritchie knows that. He's going to try to throw it inside, regardless if it's Slauson, Heen, or anybody else. He missed the free throw. Slauson bats it back. And they already missed the rebounding presence of the big guy. That's exactly right. Slauson off the shot fake. Shot clock down to seven. Pegues the pull up hits. So Pelote right now, who's not really a true five, he's the tallest player on the floor for Western Carolina at 6'8. He and Tyler Harris are going to have to do yeoman's work. Harris driving on the freshman Vanderwall. Where does Trey Jackson come into play as well? He's been quiet. Nice move by Wilbright. A game high 10 for the senior out of Albany, Georgia. He said it. He's kind of one of those point forwards. Furman spacing the floor. He had the post up. They get the switch with Wilbright. Hain doubled, looking for help. Blocked, Bothwell the follow, no. Wilbright had the rebound, and Hain mauled him. That's two on Garrett Hain. Well, there's part of what we're talking about also. The Catamounts double inside. The problem is Tyler Harris didn't put a body on Bothwell. They dodged a bullet right there on the miss. But when you're asking, what do they do with Claude on the bench? Well, they're going to double inside and try to force Heen Slauson to throw it inside out. So Heen to the bench with two fouls. Good matchup here. Jones and Pegues both very quick. Now Wilbright. There's the... The value of Slauson, I'd listed as the starting center, but he can guard one through five. Pelot, rebound to Slauson. Seven points, four rebounds for Slauson, make it ten points, his second three. And a timeout by Justin Gray. Ray's not very happy about that. Lack of transition by the Catamounts. Largest lead for the Paladins at six. Jalen Slauson now leads all scorers with 10 points. 
at last possession call caused Western Carolina coach Justin Gray to cause a timeout. Russell Jones Jr. kind of sort of porting on the defense, but you see Woolbright just too lackadaisical, and it allowed Slauson that run in, that step in three from the top of the key, which is where he's best when he's shooting behind the arc. Uh, he has really improved his shooting throughout his career. 38% from three this season. Woolbright, strong drive, could not finish. Now whip the other way. Furman pushing tempo. Slauson pull up three, gets fouled on the shot, and three shots coming. It's on Tyler Harris. The two things, that's, that's one of the cardinal sins in basketball, fouling the three-point jump shooter. But that's just what Justin Gray took a timeout for to talk to his team that Slauson, look, it, it may not be at the top of his individual scouting report, but he's shooting 38% from three, and he'll take those when he's open. That's two possessions in a row now. Slauson hit one, and now he comes back, and he gets a chance at three free throws. Same sequence, trailer on the break yep. both times. And that's where he's going to be. There's no secret. When he's in the game, he's generally going to be the trail. If he's the first post of the block, it'll be Heen, who's also a capable shooter from that, that spot. Offensive rebound, Vanderwall and Bockwell hits from the outside. So a four-point possession. Where are you, Tyjon Claude? We marked it down just two and a half minutes ago. Since Claude went to the bench, Furman on a 9-2 run. Jackson using the shot fake. Bothwell stays with him. Shot clock into single digits. Wolbright's had to do it all by himself. Jones. And they wave off the shot. We get a foul. We it's on Slauson. That's two. Yeah, we talked about it that last possession. Granger just gets caught kind of flat-footed. That allows the rebound and then the kick out to Bothwell. And you can sure bet that Claude is asking Coach Gray or that staff if he can go back in. But he's had some problems with fouls over the course of this season. Meanwhile, Slauson now on the bench as well with two fouls. That's difficult. I, I do think that the Paladins are a little deeper without him, but he's the player of the year. Make no mistake, his value is immense. Wolbright straight to the rim and able to draw the foul. certainly seen something and allowed Woolbright kind of just free reign to drive to the rim. Boy, he's had multiple drives, straight line drives where he hasn't made it all the time, but boy, he's been super aggressive. A dozen for Vontarius Woolbright. NBA Sunday night, it's a doubleheader. Jason Tatum and the Celtics hosting the Knicks. That's at 7.30, followed by Desmond Bain and the Grizz, who are second in the West, taking on Kawhi and the Clippers. That game tips off at 10 p.m. Not sure what they're questioning right now. Substitution, I guess. Now this gets interesting now. You look at Furman, Bothwell and Slauson, both on the bench. You've got Claude on the bench for Western Carolina. So it becomes a little bit of what bench can step up and keep it going. At the same time, can a guy like Trey Jackson, can he step up now and help the Catamounts? Here comes Witt. Western has stayed in that man-to-man. -man. And Pegues knocks down the three. He is such an important player for their success. Rightfully so, Slauson and Bothwell get the headlines, but he's a kid that, as a sophomore, doesn't mind the big moments. 
A double-digit score this year. Jones, nothing there. And a foul against Western Carolina. And you get the sense momentum has certainly shifted in Furman's favor. And what do the Catamounts do to try to just stem the tide a little bit? They're going to the free throw line now. But the previous possession, Pagis is one-on-one. -on -one, gets just enough of a screen right there by Huey to free himself from Jackson. And he can knock it home. The foul on Russell Jones. The Winthrop transfer picks up his second. Furman now in the bonus. And the freshman, Ben Vanderwall, 11 points, six rebounds, a ton of energy. And he put the punctuation uh, the win against Mercer with a nice dunk. Yes, he did. He was turnover prone a little bit early in the year. But, boy, that's, that's natural for a freshman. But he's really found his spot on a experienced, talented team. He's one of the one of the bright young freshmen in the Southern Conference. Furman with its largest lead of the game at 13. Granger banging in the post. Nice touch. That was an important basket for the Catamounts. Pegues open for three, knocks it down. 37% on the season. He's looking more like a 47% shooter. Stepping up with confidence. And he knows Bothwell and Slauson are on the bench. And it becomes even more of his team right now. He leads Furman with 13. I don't think there was any question he came in here with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. He was not voted to any of the three all-conference teams. Jackson threw it up to the rim. The last touch by Furman. J.P. Pegues putting together quite the tournament. He was not voted all Southern Conference. It doesn't matter. He'll prove it on the court. Knocking down another three. Paladins up 14. J.P. Pegues at 22 in the quarterfinal win, 13, including three threes in the first half. Yeah, he's knocking it down from everywhere. I mean, he's got the three going, but he's got that little mid-range pull-up. He's been solid. Right, the Paladins started one of eight behind the arc. They're now five of six since, due in part to Pegues. And he has stepped up in particular when Bothwell and Slauson have gone out. Slauson with two fouls. And the other subplot for Western Carolina, you said mark down the 758 timestamp when Tyjon Claude picked up his second foul. Since then, Furman's on a 17 to six run. And they've given up a couple of offensive rebounds to the, to the Paladins. Their defense, they've got to shore that up. I mean, the, the Paladins are on pace for oh, 50 points and a half. You're just not going to beat them. And Justin Gray wanted to keep this game in the 60s. <laughs> I think he said for the game, not, the, not a half. But it is, it's, it's all about the defense right now for Western Carolina. And you see after that timeout, Gray really forced to put Claude back in the game. Pelote misses the front end of the one and one, both teams in the bonus. If I'm Furman, as well as Pegues is playing, I go right at Tyrese Huey so he can go at Tyjon Claude, who's back in there with the two fouls. Slauson still on the bench for Furman after picking up his second. Huey setting the screen. Pegues gets free, almost went in. Rebound batted into the air. Foster saves it and throws it out of bounds off of Jones. X Factor, right? Wow, what an athletic move. That's the kind of winning plays, little things that matter. The miss by Pegues and then the long rebound after the tap out. You can watch five and white right there. Like a wide receiver, just being able to hold one foot in bounds. But again, the little things this time of year can, winning be, can be defined by that. Taking charges, getting those 50-50 balls. Foster, a terrific rebounder for a guard, averages better than five a game. 
Bothwell posting up Jackson. No double. Bothwell with the left hand. Count it. And the free throw. And that's now two on Trey Jackson. Boy, everything going Furman's way right now. And they are sensing the moment where they can really take charge. Not a ton of contact by Jackson, certainly a foul, but Bothwell has that body and the ability to take the hit, finish with contact. He erased all doubts. See, he had, had a streak of three straight single-digit scoring games until the season finale at Samford where he just went off for 35. Scored the first 18 points for the Paladins, and he is certainly back. He had 36 earlier this season against Stephen A. Austin. 30 in a win against Louisville last year. Scoring champion in the SoCon, Mike Bothwell. Woolbright over Foster. And there's Bothwell for the rebound. It's a 16-point advantage for Furman. Looking to get back to the conference championship game. This is a one-bid league. Only the winner of this tournament goes dancing. Bothwell's three, no good. And the rebound comes to Pelot. Jackson, stutter step, hesitation. Ran into Huey and still finishes. That's the guy that's got to get going for Western Carolina. He can put points on the board in a hurry. They just, oh, wow, missed that right there. No, the officials didn't miss it. Sorry. I'm not sure the officials won't go look at this. For a potential flagrant one. Watch the bottom right of the screen on the replay. And you see number four in white just take a hit right there by 24 purple Bernard Pelote. Here's a second look from. He'll say he was just trying to take away a cut. That was a hard physical foul. Doesn't affect Vanderwall at the line. Yeah, just a little welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> At halftime, we've got Dallin Cuff and Kevin Connors in the studio. They'll introduce you to the Ohio Valley Conference champion. And a recap of Saturday's action. It's the All-State Halftime Report coming up in just a few minutes. It's that, that time of year, partner. Semifinals, finals of so many conferences. So much fun. Jackson inside the quad. And we get a foul. Well, again, Jackson involved in that play. Doesn't get credit for the assist, but nice two-man game right there with Claude rolling to the basket. Vanderwall picks up his second. Champ Week continues on the ESPN Networks tomorrow. The West Coast Conference semifinals. BYU and the one seed St. Mary's at 9. San Fran Gonzaga at 11.30 on ESPN 2. Four pretty good teams right there. Yeah. <laughs> Preparing for, for today, I didn't watch the end of that San Francisco Santa Clara game, but well, you you only worked about what four games yesterday? Yes. <laughs> How about Pegues? 15 to lead all scores. It's the first time watching Furman. He's showing you the whole package. He can knock it down behind the arc. He's got a mid-range, nice little stutter right there, and defending at a nice level as well. Granger follows, gets blocked. Granger doing what he can inside. He just doesn't have the lift to get it off over those athletic paladins. He'll take a break. Offense, yeah. defense, substitution with Claude coming in. Now watch it here again. Nice job at least corralling it, recycling the possession. Woolbright gets it into Pelot. Huey defending Claude. 40 seconds to go in the half. Pelote for three. And 
and that doesn't go. Tipped into the air. Huey corrals the board. About a four-second differential between game clock and shot clock. Al Pagese has been seen as, what, the third musketeer on this team? Not in this tournament. He led the team in scoring yesterday. He leads the team in scoring in the first half with 15. Pagese leaning in, too strong. Now Claude, final ticks. Wilbright, Campbell, gives it up. Jones, got to put it up. Throws it toward the rim, no good. And the first half ends. The Paladins of Furman, 20 minutes away from getting back to the SoCon Championship. Well, a slow start shooting for the Paladins. But boy, they found the rhythm. J.P. Pagese, I should say, found the rhythm. But Bothwell, Slauson, all the usual suspects really played well. They go into half up 15, but trust me, Bob Ritchie will not rest at this entire team in 20 minutes of play. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, does that speak to Western Carolina having to pressure the ball, maybe gamble a little more? Yeah, I think they've got to try to get after Pagese and Furman in general. They've got to ramp up the defense. I mean, they were just one of nine from three, but you can't let Pagese and Bothwell just dictate what they want to do. You've got to extend a little bit. Both teams come out with their original starting five. Ontarius Wilbright over to Jackson, and Trey Jackson is a guy who can be a microwave. He had a 47-point game last month against Wofford where he hit eight threes and knocks down a triple to begin the scoring in the second half. I almost mentioned that he was held in check. Just five points. Only got four shots off. Garrett Heen scores and the foul on Campbell. That's terrific basketball. I guess is that was a set play out of halftime by Bob Ritchie. A little two-man game trying to put Claude in a situation where does he have to guard Bothwell or does the shorter Campbell then have to switch out on Heen? Either way, advantage Paladins. Heen, a junior out of Concord, North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte. Both of these schools traveled pretty well to Asheville. Furman from Greenville, South Carolina, only an hour away. Western Carolina from Cullowee, North Carolina, only an hour away. Pagese, who had 15 in the first half. Offensive rebound, Slauson stays with it. Out of a double team, kicks it back out to Pagese, who resets. Slauson looking at the, at the official like there was a foul. Long three there by Pagese offline. Now Jackson. Stolen away. Pagese accelerates the other way. And fouled by Jones. That's three on the Winthrop transfer. Pagese reads that. He really read that the whole way. Jackson got a little bit out of control, but he knew where he was going to come up with that deflection and steal. And then what he and the Paladin do do so well as they turn defense into offense and into points. In that first half, Western Carolina only have four turnovers. I want to say at least three were live ball, essentially pick sixes. Yeah, and, and when you have those live ball turnovers, it leads to bad things. Puts pressure on your defense. You're going to give up points. You're going to put fouls on your starters. One of the only things Pagese has missed the first free throw. He's been outstanding. 16 points to lead all scores. Bob Ritchie's team came oh so close to the NCAA tournament last year. Lost in a thrilling championship game to Chattanooga on a 35-foot buzzer beater in overtime. You can tell that Western wants to go to Jackson. They've got the taller Foster on him. Tough shot by Claude. Dean, as good as this Furman team is offensively, and they score 80-plus a game, they were number two in the conference, according to Ken Palm's defensive efficiency metrics. Well, and that's what Bob Ritchie has preached all year. He knew that they would have the ability to score with all their weapons. He knew the defense was going to be really what took them as far as they could go. Foster down low, draws another foul. 
And if that's on Jones, that's going to be four. It is on Russell Jones. And he's picked up two quick ones to begin the second half and has four. And he will likely head to the bench. He's a guy almost 33 minutes a game. I mean, they are used to having him on the floor. I don't know that Justin Gray is going to make a substitution yet. They're going to keep him in there. And Jones keeps looking back to the bench, <laughs> surprised. Well, you're down 15. You know, at this point, in a do-or-die situation, I think you got to kind of stay with the guys who can make it happen. Now, regardless, who do you turn to if you're Western Carolina? You saw Jackson with that three to open the half, but otherwise, who's going to be the offense right now? Now, part of me, they say that was his third foul, so I guess we have added one where it shouldn't have been there. Slauson on the fast break, and a timeout called by Justin Gray. Is this lead for Furman mushrooms to 18. Another steal to a bucket. Boy, the Paladins are good when they can defend and get out and run. Here we see it again. A turnover, a couple of dribbles, and a pass. Start to wobble here for Western Carolina. The first of two semifinals at Harris Cherokee Center in Asheville, North Carolina. Furman up by 18 on Western Carolina. The winner will get either Wofford or Chattanooga. Chattanooga, the seven seed, played Friday. They won on Friday. They knock off the two seed Samford yesterday. And then Wofford with a buzzer beater by B.J. Mack to stun UNC Greensboro. Now, if you're not familiar with this league, you might say, hey, Furman's up 18. They're going to play a six or a seven seed. Clear path, right, to, to the NCAA tournament selection Sunday? Not so fast. You're exactly right. Set me up well. Chattanooga, Jake Stevens, seven-footer. He would have been the player of the year. He was. His numbers were outstanding when he was injured on January 18th. And the Chattanooga Mox had to play 11 games without him. He's back, and he has been dominating here in the last two nights. He gets the block on Jackson. We wondered how Stevens would look as Bothwell heads to the free throw line. Came back, first game Friday night, first round game, conference tournament. Didn't miss a beat, was knocking down threes, blocking shots, his passing was crisp, had a double-double, and then made some great plays down the stretch, even when he was gassed in the win yesterday. Yeah, he had a hand injury, so I think the one silver lining is he really didn't get out of shape, right? He was able to run. Uh, it wasn't as though something was, his leg was in a cast or whatnot, so... Uh, Again, third game now on three nights. It'll be interesting to see how he reacts later on. The last foul was called on Tajon Claude, his third. And they're going to look at it to see if it's anything more than a common foul. What do you think? Claude, zero in purple. Really just, I think he was trying to go for the right hand, but it turns out, I think it turned out to be more of a slap in the back of the head. And the call here from the officials depends. Was that a play on the ball? Yeah. At first glance, it looks like no. You see there a flagrant one. Was was the foul excessive or unnecessary? Was there a play on the ball? That's what you got to keep in mind. Was Claude trying to make a play on the ball? Watch another look right here. Watch his right arm. Or is he trying to make a play? It doesn't necessarily look like it. I'm sure he would tell you he was trying to get the upper arm or shoulder of Bothwell, but turns out he didn't get anything. So the officials talking to both coaches. We'll get the explanation here. Yeah, and it was confirmed, a flagrant one, so there'll be two shots by Bothwell, and then they'll get the ball. So just yet another possession that goes against Western Carolina. And that's a double whammy because that's now another foul on Tajon Claw. 
And you could almost sense the frustration as that play unfolded. Well, and the Paladins just hitting on all cylinders right now, and it starts with defense. We talk so much about their offense and high octane, 82 punch plus points. That how many times they've scored 90 this season? It, but really, their defense has gotten better and better as the league play has progressed, and that's really what fuels their offense. Bothwell on the drive, the kick, it's Heen, air ball. Wolbright's pass, deflected, but clawed. Now the double from Slauson. Wolbright stays in bounds, and clawed finishes, goes down, and we get a whistle. Nice pass, a terrific catch right there on the baseline. You see right here the cut by Wolbright, stays in bounds, and then just dumps it down to the cutting clawed. And that's really, again, we talk about Claude and his value to this Catamount team as a scorer, as a rebounder, as a low post presence, as a defender. He's got to stay on the floor, and it kind of feels like now or never here the next couple of minutes for the Catamounts. They've got to string some stops together. Got to make a run. Down by 17 after Claude completed the three point play. He picked up his third foul. Slauson's three not there. Western Carolina, meanwhile, has not had the three-point shot today. Just two out of ten. Jones will try, make it two out of 11. They were 10 of 22 yesterday in the win against ETSU. They said coming in, they're going to have to knock down some threes, loosen up the defense. Haven't been able to do it so far. That's the great equalizer when you're an underdog. You're on the road. You're trying to do something to stay with a really talented team like Furman is. Jackson, after hitting that first three to open the half, again, it's kind of gone quiet. Western staying in man-to-man. -man. Pegues has the mismatch, drives past Granger. He saw it, his eyes lit up, and he scored. It's really been that easy. It's been just an offensive explosion and proper execution by Furman, who still does not have a turnover in this game. We've played over 24 minutes of high-level basketball. Kickball. It has been the J.P. Pegues show. He is still cooking in the second half. He sees a one-on-one -on -one against Granger. Left hand, no problem. Paladins up big. Coming up next on ESPN2 and ESPN Deportes, it is the XFL. San Antonio and Houston, week three of the XFL, coming your way at 8 Eastern once we're done in the SOCON. Furman with a 19-point lead, 15.40 to go in the second half. A trip to the conference championship, which is tomorrow on the line. The winner of this game gets the winner of our second game, Chattanooga and Wofford. And uh, this Furman team, they're big two, as good as any mid big two in the mid-majors. Jalen Slauson, Mike Bothwell, both had an extra year after last season. Both could have gone anywhere. It speaks to the culture Bob Ritchie has built that they came back to play at Furman because they would have had options. They had a lot of options, and you're exactly right. It is a true program in Greenville, South Carolina, and it's been like that for several years. Woolbright on the offensive board. It really started the 2015-2016 season. They've been so good in SoCon play. The Geese. And he will draw the foul with a chance to get to 20 points for the second straight game. And it's like the Geese right there. I mean, it just the beat goes on. But the defense is really what yesterday in the second half, they came out and they pressed Mercer 
and forced them into 14 turnovers in the second half. And it changed the course of the game. And now today, they haven't pressed, but they've been rock solid in the half court. You see their, their three-point defense in about a game and a half, a little more than that. Bob Ritchie's group, just five of 34, their opponents, 15%. You're going to win a lot of basketball games when you defend at that level. Yeah, especially with the way basketball is played these days when teams you know, take 40% of their shots or more from three. And Western Carolina, just two of 12 here this afternoon. And that was a team that Justin Gray was so proud. They were the, they were last last year in Southern Conference at 29% as a team behind the arc. They came in today at almost 35%, but just not able to find the range. Wolfwright has been the offense. He's got 17. He leads Western Carolina. He challenged the best defensive player, Slauson, in the Southern Conference. He and Kobe Langley, the two best. I'm not trying to jinx it here, but Furman still hasn't turned the ball over. Well, and look, they... There, there hasn't been enough pressure. Let me just say that. I mean, Western Carolina has tried to keep them in front of them, but they haven't gotten after them. And at the same time, there's been a little bit of, a little too much one-on-one -on -one ball by Western Carolina, and it's evidenced by just four assists on 15 made field goals. Yes, Woolbright's been good, but boy, there's been a lot of pressure for him to, to get in the lane. He hadn't been able to find open perimeter shooters. It almost seems that's Furman's M.O. We want to make Wolbright a scorer instead of somebody who gets everybody else involved. And he came in leading the SoCon in assists. And at, well, you see a little bit of full court pressure there by Jackson, at least trying to get up in to Carter Witt. They will say Jackson touched that last. McGee's with a very quick break. Watch it here again. Who hit that last? It looked like Jackson yeah. did get his left hand on it. He throws it right back to Slauson, who can handle it. Not much Slauson can't do, as you mentioned earlier in the game. Jackson staying with Pegues. Who drives to the basket and scores anyway. 21 for J.P. Pegues after 22 yesterday. I love all 10 coaches in the Southern Conference. I just, it's beyond me how they couldn't have voted him one of the top 15 players after what he did this season. Well, Furman wins this thing tomorrow. And he might be the MOP of this tournament as Jackson gets fouled by Pegues. He was making threes in the first half. Now they're taking that away, and he's got some straight line drives. A little help with a screen by Slauson, but boy, he splits the defenders right there. Claude not able to get there in time to help. No reason, no wonder he's got a little smile on his face. Sophomore from Nashville playing exceptionally well in Asheville. Trey Jackson, the transfer from Iowa State. He was on a Sweet 16 team last year. Second team all-conference, top five in the league in scoring. And with the way Western Carolina plays, and Jackson really is the catalyst. If he can get hot, you got a chance to shoot yourself you know, back into single digits, and then things can get interesting. But it almost feels like it's got to start with number three. There's no question. You now, Woolbright should be the distributor as a first option. And, but Jackson is that guy. And that's not to say Claude can't score inside and others can't add. But yeah, Trey Jackson is clearly the guy that's going to lead you back. Claude's the guy that's got to help you kind of be one and done at the defensive end. got the pace slowed up again. They've got to do a lot of things better, but I think first and foremost, Trey Jackson's got to be the guy to try to take and make good shots moving forward over the next couple of minutes and see where things are at about the eight or nine minute mark. 
Garrett he just picked up his fourth foul Will Bright driving on Slauson denied it'll stay with the Catamounts well, Will Bright won the last one-on-one -on -one with Slauson Slauson's not gonna lose two in a row fifth-year guy out of Somerville South Carolina watch it again moves his feet Really blocks it with two hands right there. You mentioned it earlier. Slauson was the defensive player of the year last year and second in the voting this year to UNCG guard Kobe Langley. Shot clock down to four. It's Wolbright again. That is a shot clock violation, or did they get a foul on Huey? They did. And Will Bright leaned into that one. He sold it, and he'll get two shots for his efforts. Well, again, and I, boy, he did sell it. A little bit of a bailout, but, you know, Catamount's just kind of standing around watching Will Bright try to operate. Russell Jones and the freshman DJ Campbell check back in. What can you do if you're Justin Gray defensively to try to change things and flip the script a little bit? Can you apply some full court pressure? Can you trap a little bit? I think you've got to try to do something because if not, as good as JP Pegues has been, he can just carve you up. Would you full court press this Furman team? Well, probably not, but I think I think you you can't let Pegues just operate out there and find guys like Williams or score for himself. He's just been too good this this game. Yeah, the options aren't great right now for Western Carolina. Wolbright's pass deflected. Jones trapped in the corner. Skip pass to Jackson. 12 to shoot. Jackson recovers down the lane. Wild layup. Got it. A little dipsy do. Huey and Foster have been good on Jackson. Their size and length has caused some problems. But he's able to get to the to the rim. It's 13. Slauson again going to work with the big height advantage. Now you felt like there was a little shift in momentum. Jackson's drive at the other end, that little horse kind of shot, a little dipsy do, brought him back, but now Slauson at the other end with a chance at free throws when we come back. Champ Week continues tomorrow on ESPN and ESPN2. West Coast Conference semifinals. There will be another St. Mary's Gonzaga showdown in the championship. BYU and San Francisco We'll have something to say about that. That is Monday on ESPN and ESPN2. In our game, Furman leading Western Carolina 58 to 45. Still time left. 11.36 to go. How did the Catamounts find flow offensively? Well, I, I think they need to try to defend at a little higher clip and hopefully get some defensive rebounds, turnovers, and turn that into offense. They, they're not getting anything easy. So if you can't get baskets in transition easy, then to your point in the half court, you gotta have a little bit of spacing. I think that Woolbright, you can set him up outside in some screen and roll situations, but he's gotta try to find Jackson or Campbell on the wings. You said uh, the magic word, turnover. Furman has zero so far. Yeah, we've played, what, 28 plus minutes. I mean, it's a, it's, it just speaks to how good this team is, the most complete team in the Southern Conference, and also 10 assists on 19 field goals, but that's really about their average. They assist 55 to 60%. Most coaches are happy at 50%. Wolbright down low to Claude. Over Slauson, too much. Offensive rebound. And clean up. That wasn't the prettiest, but it was a nice set. And Wolbright found Claude, who then had a little stick to itiveness to it to stay with that over Slauson. 
11 points in 19 minutes for Claude. Slauson out to Vanderwall from the corner. Bothwell gets it back, throws it up and in. And it saves, you know, saving it under your opponent's basket never, let me say, it usually doesn't end in a positive result right there. You see a little better ball movement, a little better spacing right here. Trying to find somebody. But it's one and done. That's the other thing. They just have not been able to get anything off the offensive glass for putback, save a couple by Claude. Piggies down low over Campbell. And Claude secures the rebound. Load at the other end in Western Carolina. Makes it a 62-49 game. 9.40 to go in regulation. Winner to championship Monday. Really mark that down. It's really one of the first fast break opportunities that the Catamounts have capitalized on. And there is the first turnover of the game for Furman on an offensive foul by Mike Bothwell. Now they get a basket, a fast break basket at one end, and then Campbell's moving his feet at the other. That's an interesting call right and there. He's clearly <laughs> moving his feet. Yeah. And if there's contact, that's on the defender by rule. Well, regardless, an opportunity now for Western. Granger. And there's Wilbright. And there's the one swinging. Yeah. A little bit of momentum, a little bit of energy for Western Carolina right now. Slauson sets the screen for Pegues. Bothwell calling for a screen. Doesn't get it. Gets the double. Slauson, the drive and dish, took a shot. Foster throws it up to the rim. Western Carolina in transition. Jackson for three. It's good! And the Catamounts have closed to within eight, down by as many as 20. What do they say? Momentum doesn't have any allegiance. There's a lot of purple in this arena right now. The purple for Cat the Catamounts, they're on their feet. A 7-0 run by the Catamounts. Furman in the second half. 5 of 16 from the field. 0 for 9 from 3. Western Carolina pushing the tempo. They're going Allegro. And they've closed this to within 8. They were down by as many as 20 in this half. Well, they haven't given up. And I don't think a Justin Gray team would. And they just stayed with it. Their defense ramped up a little bit. They got the turnover when Bothwell was called for the offensive charge. They've had a couple of stops, and now they got an easy basket. And then that guy right there, Colin Granger, rather than take the potential layup, kicks it out to Trey Jackson. That is trust in your teammate. Granger, the <laughs> Ohio transfer who was on that Bobcat team a few years ago that beat Virginia in the NCAA tournament. Well, I guess when you got a teammate who's put 47 up in a league game, and what does yeah. Furman do? They go to Old Reliable, the scoring champion of the SOCON, Bob Well. Yeah, Bob Ritchie, so good. Out of the timeout, he knew that Western was going to pressure, potentially overplay. What do you do when you're overplayed? You go back door. Nice cut right there by Bothwell. Bob Ritchie knows his team. He knows how they're going to be defended. Back door, so effective, but Keen the dribble at Bothwell, and the defender thinks there's going to be a handoff. And when you start cheating that way, the defender overplays, you go back door. Nice pass by Heen as well. 
Furman, a 75% free throw shooting team. Not today, just 16 out of 28. And that has left the door ajar for a comeback. And you can only imagine how does Furman react as things get tight? Jackson throws it up. He rushed that one. Sloss in the trailer. He's hit a couple of threes. Now Foster ran into Granger. But so plenty of time. Terrific switch by Granger and Jackson right there. But Geese had an advantage for a moment. Slauson can't get it. A lot of contact. Officials letting them play as they should in tournament play. We come up on seven and a half. Claude getting ready to check in for Western Carolina. The top rebounder in the SOCOM. Wolbright, spin cycle, over Heen, offensive rebound, Granger, a foul on Furman, sixth team foul on the Paladins. This one was on the verge of blowout city. Western Carolina from Culloway, North Carolina has made it a game. Dean Keener, what has been the anatomy of a comeback? Well, we see it right here. Sometimes it's not always what you do right, but what you don't do wrong that helps you win games. And Western Carolina, they stopped turning it over. They've defended by taking a charge. And then that Granger to assist to Trey Jackson has pulled the, the Catamounts not only within single digits, this 7-0 run has woke their crowd up. It's woke their bench up. And they now believe that they got a chance to upset the Furman Paladins. Yeah, still plenty of time left. 7-18 to go in regulation. Both teams in the bonus. Fulbright's got 20. He finds Jackson. Down low. Claude with authority. And the Furman lead is six, a two-possession game. I think you'll also notice the Wofford and Chattanooga fans now cheering for Western Carolina <laughs> as they've entered the building. Well, the old, be careful what you wish for. Campbell deflects it out of bounds. Well, the, the run continues. Trey Jackson... Watch the no-look pass right here. Whoop. And then Claude just claws his way to the rim. Now we talked about that, the lack of assists early in this game. They're sharing the ball more in the half court. Bothwell with a deft touch by the rim. 64-56. Six and a half to play. A much-needed basket. Bothwell had to come this one inside. Now Bothwell gets the steal. First team also caught. He'll wait for the Cavalry. Hello, tasked with marking Bothwell. Hain sets the screen, 12 to shoot. Coming up on six minutes to play in regulation. McGee says 21, shot clock at three. Bothwell lets it go. Heen, the offensive rebound, and a foul on Western Carolina. Well, you did everything right if you're Western Carolina except finish the play. With good closeouts, good one-on-one -on -one defense. They contested the shot, Wolbright did, but you didn't finish it. You didn't have that box out. Jackson just doesn't get a body on Heen. Third foul on Jackson, and Heen came into this tournament Shooting just 50% from the free throw line. One and one. And he gets the front end. It's interesting. He's 54% from the floor. He's only, you know, you say 50% give or take free throw shooter. Explain that. Yeah, well, I don't, it's hard it, because like that one right there really looked good. There's good follow through, good rotation. And he's a pretty yeah. good three point shooter, 38%. Yeah. So it's not like he's limited from that range. There's been a number of guys like that in this tournament, but you almost want to tell a guy like he just shoot a jump shot from 15 feet at the, when you're shooting free throws. Regardless, two big ones right there. The lead back up to 10. 
Furman led by as many as 20. Western Carolina trimmed it to six just a few moments ago. Wolfright looking for help. Slauson does not yield an inch. And the Catamounts forced to burn a timeout. They only have one left. Well, I've said it before. When you pick your dribble up, you're guarding yourself. So now Wolbright got stuck, picked his dribble up. Slauson's got size and defensive awareness on him, and he just didn't have anywhere to go. His teammates didn't help either. They didn't cut to an open area. That said, still 12 on the clock and an opportunity for Justin Gray to draw something up. Very little has come easy for the top teams in this tournament. There was a big three in the SOCON coming into Asheville. It was Furman, it was Samford, it was UNC Greensboro. Furman yesterday, down at the half against Mercer, had to go to a full court press to win the second half. Big lead in this game, Western Carolina not dying. Samford and UNC Greensboro both lost in the quarterfinals, which was a surprise to many. Yeah, been a lot of dynamics involved in the Southern Conference this year, but I think that happens when you get to March, you get to a one-game situation. You know, Samford, I, Quez Glover, their leading scorer, got hurt, sure. didn't play in the second half. It was That was a tough break for them after what was a terrific season for Bucky McMillan in the group, but you're exactly right. It is wide open right now. Wolbright to Palote. That's the Wolbright that we've seen in the SOCON this year when he led the conference in assists. On the backdoor cut, Bothwell blocked by Wilbright. Jackson the other way. Entry pass, Claude blocked by Slauson. No whistle, letting him play. You gotta love it if you're Furman. I mean, Wilbright threw it only where Claude could catch it, but Slauson was able to recover in time, not once, but twice. Slauson, shot fake, drops it off for Bothwell, and an offensive foul. The question was, Woolbright outside that restricted arc, that's number one, and was he moving? And more importantly for Furman, the foul is on Slauson, and that is number four, so Slauson's got four. Heen has four, both on the floor, with four and a half to go. Slauson guarding Woolbright. This would be one of those opportunities. I would tell Woolbright, what can you do to try to get a one-on-one -on -one situation with a guy with four fouls? Foster all over Jackson. And they call Foster for the foul. A one and one coming up for Trey Jackson, the best free throw shooter in the SOCON in the regular season, although he missed a couple yesterday. He's a he's a big time player and a big game player. You got the sense on that possession, even though Slauson and Woolbright were trying to go one on one. Jackson wanted that. He wanted that opportunity. Not an unraveling by Furman of any sorts, but you do feel an uneasiness, not just in the arena, but by their team. They were cruising along, almost to the point where they got comfortable. Lo and behold, a couple of stops, a couple of baskets, and now Western Carolina right back in this thing. Jackson came into this tournament 92% from the free throw line. Had a light moment with his head coach yesterday after he missed a couple. His coach was riding him about it from the sideline, and Jackson looked over and said, I'll make this next one, and he did. That's what good players do, especially those that shoot over 90%. Two-possession game. Pegues. No good. Rebound to Wolbright. Polo gets free. Fires. Left it short, offensive rebound. Pelote again, the rainbow, pot of gold! And a blocking foul called on Jackson at the other end. 
And for Jackson, that's his fourth. My goodness, just when you thought the tires were going flat on the catamounts, Pelot pulls it within one possession. What a game in Asheville. Have a 16 to four run. They've tightened up the defense. They're sharing it offensively. And they have made this a one possession game with 3.41 to go. Every game is a season unto itself, right? And that's what you just said. They picked the defense up. Furman shooting just 27% here in the second half. They've been outscored 33-21. And yes, they've started to share the ball a little bit better as well. Just two assists in the first half. They've now got five in the second half. A one and one for Pegues, who calmly drains the first. That is back-to-back 22-point -back games for Pegues in this SoCon championship. Looking at foul trouble, Slauson and Heen have four for Furman. Jones and Jackson with four for Western Carolina as Pegues misses the second. Wolbright's been the maestro. 20 points, 10 rebounds, 4 assists. Make it 22 points. And it's 67-65. And there's only so much Jalen Slauson can do in that situation. He's got to defend, but he wants to stay on the court to make sure that they finish this off. Western Carolina trailed by as many as 20 in this half. Team size advantage, uses it. Just what the doctor ordered, little two-man game. They took it to one side, then brought it back to the other. Heen with the size advantage inside. He's been big here in the second half. Furman has Lawson guarding Wilbright. Jackson fires up a three. He was trying to draw the foul. The rebound to Pegues. And he raises his hand as to say, my bad. He understands that was a critical possession. He had his man in the air. He was trying to draw the contact. Pegues working on Jones. A 5'8 jitterbug. Shot clock down to five. Bothwell, the conference scoring champion, fouled on the drive by Wilbright. Claude got stuck there as well. Wilbright and Claude, a little two-man. Boy, Furman's been, when they've needed a basket, they've gone into a two-man game. Claude clearly reaches in. Yeah, the foul is on Claude. That's four on Claude. It is the 10th team foul, so double bonus time for Furman. Two shots the rest of the way. And Bothwell, 85% on the season. And he misses that one today, just three out of eight at the line. Very uncharacteristic. For the fifth year guy out of Cleveland Heights, Ohio. He's been so good. So good this year. I mean, you could have made an argument that he was the player of the year just as much as you could for teammate Slauson. One out of two. It remains a two-possession game as we come up on two minutes. Slauson staying with Woolrun. The turnaround and one. And if that's on Slauson, he's finished. It is on Slauson. That's number five. And the SOCON Player of the Year has fouled out with 2.02 to go. Wilbright at the line with a chance to make it a two-point game. Well, it shows you the confidence that Bob Ritchie has in Slauson to play him with four fouls. It also shows you the respect they have for Wilbright putting such a good defensive player on kind of the point forward for the Catamounts. Second look, got him on the way up. Wilbright strong enough, big enough to finish. And he pulls it to within two points. 70 to 68. Montarius Wilbright, 25 points, 10 rebounds, and four assists. Vanderwall into the game, the freshman. That's for Furman. Pegues. Out to Foster. Bothwell's calling for it. 
Shot clock winding down. McGeese has got to go. Drives on Claw, throws it to the rim. It did not hit the rim. And now a chance to take the lead with a three. Jackson the other way. The Catamounts have come all the way back. In the blink of an eye, it has turned into a potential upset alert. Absolutely amazing what the Catamounts have done the last 10 minutes of play. A timeout by Bob Ritchie. Each team has one left. A minute and 11 to go. A game that was on the verge of being over. Furman led by 20 in the second half before a furious rally by Western Carolina. We're now tied for the first time since the 948 mark of the first half. And to some extent, their defense, and, and when you play good defense, sometimes offense just happens. Right, they defended right there for 29 seconds. They get the rebound, they kick it out, and then Jackson gets yet another easy basket that they weren't getting in the first half. They really weren't getting for the first 30 minutes of the game. And now the defense, they flipped the script on Furman. The Paladins so good at turning defense into offense, now the Catamounts doing it. And Dean, it's the way they've played defense. It hasn't been turnovers. Furman only has two turnovers yeah. the entire game. And this is tied at 70 with a little more than a minute to go. But in the second half, the Paladins have been 7 for 24 from the field and 0 for 11 from 3. Yeah, they've settled at times. They got a little bit too passive and just settled for some threes. The big question now, without number 20 in white, without Jalen Slauson, he's now out with fouls. You've got plenty of offensive firepower. Right? J.P. Pagis, the ball's going to be in his hands. You've got Mike Bothwell as arguably as good a one-on-one -on -one player or in a two-man situation as there is in the Southern Conference. You've got others. Foster and Heen can score as well. So one of the issues also not making threes, the Paladins have missed free throws. They've missed eight free throws. So if it does become a free throw shooting contest down the stretch, how do they react with all the pressure on them? Bothwell with the ball in his hands. There's the double from Claude. Now Pegues. A minute to go. Foster, Pegues, down the lane, out of control. They got to put it up. Foster throws it to the rim. Shot clock violation. And Western Carolina with a chance to take the lead for the first time in the second half. We were talking about it, but where was that defense earlier in the game? They're focused, they're dialed in. Just they're locking and trailing on all ball screens. They've made a statement here. They have proven that they can compete and that they can defend the best team in the Southern Conference. Western Carolina finished in last place in this league a year ago. Second year coach Justin Gray told us, watch our huddles. One of the things he did this season, he went and clipped the huddles from every Final Four team in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Look how connected they are. He was telling us he's reading Atomic Habits. Trust the system. Hey, if the shots aren't falling, but they're good shots, don't get rattled. Stay within yourself. Stay within the process. Boy, down 20, it would have been easy to fold. Instead, they stood up. Yeah, and they've stayed together. We didn't, fo we're focusing now. They were in that huddle connected even when they were down 15, 20 points. As a coach, as a leader, as a motivator, you've got to love that. They've added some time. Not that Western is thinking two for one, but the way the clock plays out, they do have a chance at two offensive possessions here. Wilbright down the lane, sweeps in. The Catamounts take the lead. Justin Gray calls a timeout. Oh, there's a sneer of cold command on Coach's face. The Catamounts, you can hang this on the Biltmore if they're able to pull this off against a team that was the team in this conference. The Furman Paladins 
unfinished business. We heard about the heartbreak last year. This was their time. The two and three seeds go down yesterday. This bracket opened up for Furman. Western Carolina came in with a different script. Everybody talking about the yellow brick road that was opening up for Furman when the UNCG Spartans and Sanford Bulldogs went out, went, went down. Not so fast. It's been a combination, but look at the offensive end. Jackson has made some shots. He's got some fast break layups. But Vontarius Wolbright, he has been really, really good in the second half. 27 points for the game, 11 rebounds, four assists. A tour de force from the opening tip. Furman won't have Jalen Slauson. The SoCon Player of the Year fouled out. Mike Bothwell, 17 points. He's the regular season scoring champion in the conference. Pegues has 22. He did most of his damage in the first half. Who's the guy right now for Furman? It's got to be Bothwell. Right? I think it does. you got to go to the guy that's almost 2,000 points. Let me say this. I was talking earlier, Justin Gray, do you, do you start pressing? How do you change the game? Furman, he didn't change the game plan. He stuck to it. And Furman allowed Western to slow the game down. And it is played right into the Catamounts' hands. Light pressure here by the Catamounts. About an eight-second differential between the shot clock and the game clock. Bothwell down the lane and bumped down the drive. The foul is on DJ Campbell, the freshman. And two shots for Bothwell, who's only four of nine at the free throw line today but 83% for his career and 85% on the season. Just a one-on-one -on -one straight line drive right there against Campbell. I think if you're Bob Ritchie, you're okay. Put aside what Bothwell's done leading up to this point. He's the guy you want at the line. And if you're Western Carolina, if Bothwell makes this, you'll have the ball with a chance to win the game. No timeouts. You are in the double bonus. If you're Justin Gray, I think as good as Wolbright has been, and without Slauson in the game, you've got to try to put him in a ball screen situation where he could go one-on-one. -on -one. Both free throws good. Tied at 72. Western Carolina does not have any timeouts. I think Furman's going to do what they can to keep the ball out of Wolbright's hands. But as we've mentioned so many times, there are other ball handlers on this Western team. It's a team that does not turn it over. And it's Russell Jones, a Winthrop transfer now. Wolbright, 27 points. Total denial of Woolbright by Marcus Foster right now. He's got to watch he doesn't foul. Jones, six seconds. Jones, less than five seconds. He's got to put it up. Jones for the win. Oh, we've got overtime in Asheville. We'll go to overtime. Garrett Heen is okay with that. The Paladins will be without Jalen Slauson, but make no matter, this has turned into what you really expect in Southern Conference basketball. I thought there at the end, Russell Jones Jr., he had Bernard Pilat up top. He made the decision to go one-on-one. -on -one. Just, you love the decision defensively, Watch Marcus Foster denying number two, Woolbright. They just weren't going to let him beat them like he had been doing so much here in the second half. They were going to make somebody else. Jackson tried to flash into that open free throw area. Pelot was open. In the end, Jones just couldn't get it off. And we got an extra five minutes. If you are just joining us, a trip to the SoCon Championship is on the line. Furman, the number one seed, played in the conference championship a year ago lost on a 35-foot buzzer beater in overtime to chattanooga david g baptiste hit the shot
the mantra all season for the Furman Paladins, unfinished business. Jalen Slauson and Mike Bothwell, first-team all-conference players, returned for a fifth season. For Furman, it was simple. They had done everything but win this tournament, win this conference championship. Western Carolina was a last-place team in the SoCon a year ago. Big turnaround this year. They trailed by 20 in the second half, fought valiantly, got back into the game, and now with a chance to win it in overtime. And Furman is without the SoCon player of the year, Jalen Slauson, who fouled out. Still plenty of firepower, and I think they'll miss Slauson as much at the defensive end and that guy that can guard Woolbright as they will at the offensive end. He'll need to be a heck of a cheerleader. But you got to credit Western Carolina. They gave up 45 points in the first half, just 27 in the second half. Race cars don't idle well, and that's what they were able to do with the Furman Paladins. DJ Campbell, the freshman, can't get the layup. Offensive rebound, it comes to Pelot. A new 20. Got to imagine there's a little bit of tightness and uneasiness with Furman right now. Jackson, the three. Good! 22 for the Iowa State transfer. And Western Carolina leads by three. Foster at the other end. You no! Know, the rebound to Pelote. Jackson has come alive in this second half. Jackson splits the D. Claude in trouble, and jump ball is the call. Possession arrow to Furman. Dean, you get into overtime of an elimination game. How big was that first three-point shot by Jackson? It was huge. I, and I think it's a it's as big for Trey Jackson as it is just Western in general. Watch it here, just one-on-one. -on -one. Bothwell defends it well, gets his arm up, but Jackson just sometimes better offense than defense. But yeah, it's a mindset right now, and it puts pressure on Furman. They don't have to get it all back at once. Furman 0 for 11 from three in the second half. Six of 28 for the game. McGee's using the screen with five to shoot. Let's it go. The three's not falling. Bothwell, the offensive rebound. He'll try. Still not there. Rebound, Pelote. The two guys you want taking long-range shots. If you're Bob Ritchie, both contested. Claude in the high post wing area. Now Pelote. Less than 10 to shoot. Jackson with five. Against Bothwell. Pelot launches. Air ball. Good defensive stop for Furman. They've now got to get back to their offense. Cutting, screening. Nice cut right there by Vanderwall. They get Pelot with the foul. Vanderwall, 67% at the free throw line this season. A freshman getting ready for the biggest free throws of his young career. And a little bit of a funny spin on it, but Vanderwall knocks it down calmly. Impressive freshman. Jalen Slauson can only watch. Unanimous player of the year in the SOCON. He was the defensive player of the year last season. Both free throws good. Western Carolina nurses a one-point lead. A little three-quarter court with Vanderwall at the top with his length. Woolbright exuding calmness 
Turns the corner, driving on the freshman reverse layup, good. 29 for the senior. He's so steady, he's been so steady in the second half, has taken what the defense has provided him. Bothwell against Claude, who's got four fouls. Bothwell will shoot a three, and it goes! Tied at 77. First three since halftime for Furman. And you wouldn't expect anybody else but Mike Bothwell to step up and take that shot. Claude off the feed from Wilbright. Claude, excuse me, Wilbright just playing at another level right now. Furman just doesn't have an answer other than to totally deny him like they did on that last possession of regulation. I'm not sure Bothwell's gonna give this up. Bothwell again for three. And he's fouled. Three shots coming from Mike Bothwell. It's on Claude. So Tyjean Claude has fouled out. Clearly a foul as he does not allow Bothwell any, any position to come down. You knew that Bothwell wasn't going to give it up when the clock was under 10. Now three shots for Mike Bothwell after Justin Gray determines who he's going to get to replace Claude. Not a ton of options on that bench. They've only played eight this afternoon. Now that's the danger territory for Western Carolina. They do not have the depth that Furman does. And Bothwell with 22 points. If he hits all three, he would give Furman its first lead in overtime. There have been a lot of great players in Furman history. None better than Mike Bothwell. I think Selby put up 100 how many years ago. But this is a guy that he is now approaching 2,000 career points. He's gotten better every year. And you just can't say enough about what he's done for this program. And remember in the SoCon Championship, it was Bothwell who scored that go-ahead basket with 4.3, but he misses the last free throw and cannot give the Paladins the lead. Tied with less than a minute to go. Wilbrunt driving on Foster. And we will get a foul on Furman. It looked like Wilbright slipped. They said he was pushed. The foul is on Foster, and two shots coming. They just have the, the Palin just haven't had an answer. That was as much a slip, I thought, on the baseline. They just haven't had an answer, though, for Woolbright. I think that left wow. foot, just whether it's per perspiration or not, you saw the reaction by Marcus Foster there when the whistle blew. Woolbright really has not come out of the game. Seven of eight from the line today. Now the second free throw, only 66% on the season. One out of two. Traffic by Vanderwall to free Pagese so he can get the Paladins in the offense. You've got to believe they want to go back to Mike Bothwell. Pagese almost lost it. Hounded by Campbell. Pagese throws it up and gets the foul call. It's on Pelot. Four on the sophomore from Savannah, Georgia. 
Really wasn't much else that Pagese could do at that time. Watch it here again. He knows he gets below just enough in the air, but another look ground level. I thought Pagese leaned in maybe as much as Pelote was there defending. Boy, that's a that's a bang bang play. Officials yeah. have a hard job. Yeah. But for the latter part of this game, they were letting these guys play and these last couple of possessions, boy. I think, I think they wanted to make sure that, that it was a three point if his feet, it does look in fact like they were behind. And they're gonna give Pagese three. It is a three shot foul. JP Pagese, 22 points, four off the career high. He scored a 22 in both games in this SOCON tournament. Has really blossomed as a sophomore. Question mark coming into the season. Not so much as what he could be, but more so who he was replacing in Alex Hunter. And he has turned into a constant and a dependable piece for this Furman team. No question. We've talked it time and time again. Hunter, 122 career starts, 111 career wins. That was an all-time record until Bothwell and Slauson just recently broke it. They currently sit at 113 career wins. And Pagese has started all 32 double figures in 13 of his last 14. Now 14 of 15. Three shots for a 70% free throw shooter. This for the lead. The free throw woes continue. That has been an Achilles heel for the Paladins today. Normally a very good free throw shooting team. They've taken 43 free throws today, but have only made a 27. That's 63%. The shot clock still set at 20. Really needs to be turned off, correct. That second free throw that did not go proves large. 81-80, Western Carolina will have the ball. The shot clock is turned off. So another chance where the Catamounts have the final possession like they did at the end of regulation with a chance to win. And if you're a Furman fan, you're getting flashbacks. In this arena, right, Bothwell with the drive. Four seconds to go. Chattanooga Mox inbounded, and David Jean Baptiste from 30 plus feet breaks the heart of the Paladins in really what was a classic Southern Conference Championship final. Chattanooga, the conference champions almost upset Illinois in round one. And Furman from the embers of heartbreak putting together another 25 win season. Bob Ritchie said last offseason. It was as emotional a locker room as he's ever seen. Slauson, Bothwell, fifth-year guys all returning, even though they could have gone elsewhere for one last run. Western Carolina, last place in the SoCon a year ago with a chance to get to the SoCon championship if they score on this possession. We can't get a repeat of regulation as Woolbright is able to free himself to get the ball. Here's Jackson, Overheen, back iron, Foster the rebound, Bothwell secures it, Jones commits the foul, that's five on Russell Jones, Western Carolina's not done yet, Furman has struggled at the free throw line, and even if Bothwell makes both, you still have a chance to tie, and then you get into the scenario if you're Furman, do you foul? And I, I don't know what Bob Ritchie's philosophy is. Most coaches will say when it's five seconds or under, we're going to foul. But Bothwell's got to step the line and knock down a couple of big free throws to put pressure on Western Carolina. They will add four tenths of a second. The last three games from the two night games yesterday to this one have been incredible theater. This league has been so good for so long I and mean, we showed it earlier the graphic the players the coaches that have been here and Mike 
what Mike Young did at Wofford in his last season, winning 30 games, beating Seton Hall. He's now doing great things at Virginia Tech. There's Steve Forbes, there's Wes Miller, Lamont Paris last year with Chattanooga. Bob Ritchie, kind of the next guy that's the great coaches. Without Jones now, you do lose, lose speed of transporting the ball just a little bit in transition. It's a three-point game. Bob Ritchie calls a timeout. Western Carolina still has one. Furman has one left. Bothwell, seven of his team's 11 points in overtime. Well, and most importantly, he's knocked down some really big free throws after not being so good from the line really until the last couple minutes of the game. All right, now through the Catamounts. Woolbright has been the guy all afternoon, all evening, but he's not a three-point shooter, so if you need a three, Jackson? And Jackson's your guy, right? If you could get him free, the question is, Justin Gray does have a timeout in his back pocket. He, he was out, and then he got one added during the overtime. So do you race the ball to half court? and maybe two or three seconds to try to shorten the court and an opportunity. Regardless, eight and a half seconds is more than enough time. What's Bob Ritchie telling his team? Well, he's reminding them that Trey Jackson is one of the best two or three three-point shooters. So now, do you defend him like you were defending Woolbright and try to put all out denial and force somebody else to make a play? Woolbright, the inbounder. Nobody coming to the ball, and the Catamounts have to burn their final timeout. Well, they can still run the baseline, but yeah, that now changes the course of things. Nice defense right there by Furman. They had Marcus Foster fronting Trey Jackson, and then when he went long, Bothwell picked him up like a defensive back. Campbell, others just couldn't free themselves. So now if you're Bob Ritchie, if your philosophy is to foul, with the Catamounts having to go full court, it does potentially afford you you know, a couple of seconds in the backcourt, and then you foul as they enter the front court. The only potential danger there, Dean, if you do foul, and let's say the Catamounts hit the free throws, now Western Carolina is going to foul you. And free throw shooting, while well, it's been good most of the season, it hasn't been good tonight for Furman. Yeah, and I think part of it depends on how quickly they can get a shot up. If I'm Bob Ritchie, I foul. I don't, there's too many things have to go right when you foul somebody and they're down three. Jackson will inbound. He can run the baseline. Look for him to throw it back to Jackson. Jackson gets it. Final five seconds. Jackson against Bothwell. Over to Granger. Two seconds. Jackson heaves it. It doesn't go. Furman survives and will play on Championship Monday. Western Carolina battled from 20 down to force overtime. But Mike Bothwell, big free throws. He was the guy down the stretch. And Trey Jackson defended well by who else? Mike Bothwell at the very end. What a fantastic game. Great players, great coaches. One of those, it's just tough to see somebody to lose. Trey Jackson just could not get off a clean look. Furman's passion and purpose just greater than the challenge at the end of the day. The Furman Paladins and their unfinished business, well, they've got one more item on their to-do list. They're back in the conference championship, looking to atone for last year, looking for redemption. They'll take on either Wofford or the team that beat them last year, Chattanooga. We've got one more semifinal in what has been 
an incredible SOCOM tournament to date. For Dean Keener and our entire ESPN crew, I'm Anish Shrop. Furman advances to the SOCOM championship. Now he's sending to Charlotte for the Big South Women's Championship.